Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. So of course, over the last few years, a lot of people have been talking about masculinity. What does it mean to be a man, a good man, a proper man, a masculine man, all of this. And that has slipped and creeped into the Muslim sphere, of course, where a lot of Muslims who are speaking English, living in English speaking world, they have been thinking about the same topic. And of course, because we're Muslim, we try, at least a lot of us, to go back to what Allah and what the Prophet ﷺ told us with regards to this. Now, there's been a lot of different ideas and attitudes. And what you see is people are not purely coming from the Quran and Sunnah when it comes to this topic. A lot of people are coming with their own thoughts, their own life experiences or cultures. And then they're trying to make, as usual, the Quran and Sunnah fit onto it. And of course, because this is a bit of a gray area, it's not an area where we have black and white lines in terms of this is masculine, this is not masculine. It's a little bit of an open area as with a lot of social issues, but it doesn't mean there is not clear guidance from the Quran and Sunnah on this. So one of the people who've been talking about masculinity is Hamza Dorsis. Of course, you know him from Ayera. He's a da'ya. He's been debating atheists and all of this stuff a lot of the time. And he felt the need to chime in on this topic. He went on the Thinking Muslim podcast, which I've been on and inshallah I should be going on very soon as well again. And he covered this topic of masculinity from his point of view with Jello. And overall, I thought it was great. So great that I should share some parts of it with you and kind of chime in as someone who's actually researched this topic. I've written a book on Islamic masculinity, not what is masculinity, but what should a good Muslim man be like, which is slightly different. So let's see what Hamza sources had to say, and I'll chime in where I can add some points, inshallah. It could be a spiritual pathology, it could be a social one, it could be psychodynamic. But I'm a true believer that true masculinity, true rudura in the Islamic tradition, is actually being able to hold down your ego. Yes, there are times you need to be assented, but at the right time. There's times to be, you know, dominant at the right time. But if that is your default state, then that's just vain of pathology. There's something very wrong with you because you're not following and in the sunnah, you're not able to bench press your ego. Yeah, so I thought this is exactly right. And this is a lot of the stuff that is not being talked about because a lot of the masculinity talk is coming from a reaction to feminism. So feminism has pushed men to kind of stay quiet, become less dominant, less proud, less loud, less controlling. And what do people do? They come and they just do the opposite. No, we're going to push and be dominant for the sake of it. And so it's just one extreme versus the other extreme, which is not what we're trying to do as Muslims because we don't need to bounce between extremes because we've been given the right guidance. So what Hamza Zulsi is talking about is, firstly, ego is not to be found within a Muslim man. 100%, obviously the one who has an atom's weight of arrogance, he will not go to Jannah whatsoever. So ego is not from Islam. Another thing he talked about, which is very relevant, is being in control of your emotions and your ego. This is a huge deal. This is actually one of the main parts of being a good Muslim man, is to not let your actions, your behaviors, what you say, be dictated by how you're feeling. No, it's to have those feelings and then think, how do I react? What would be pleasing to Allah? And of course, we always should do things with an intention. What would be pleasing to Allah? And then we go and do it. And how do you do that if you're not in control of yourself? So that's the first masculine thing. The second thing is that the Prophet ﷺ, he said, the strong one is not the one who can wrestle. It is the one who can control his anger. So even the Prophet ﷺ, he really emphasized this ability to control oneself. And that actually is the masculine thing. So then after controlling my emotions and my ego, and then deciding whether to do the dominant thing or the soft thing, the harsh thing, or the merciful thing, whatever that comes out of that will be masculine, inshallah, because we are in control of our ego, our emotions, and then we're choosing to take deliberate action. We're not supposed to focus on ourselves. That's not prophetic masculinity, for example, to focus just on me. You know, when someone wanted to see the Prophet ﷺ, they would ask, where is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? What does that mean? It means he didn't make himself distinct from the Sahaba, right? Yes. You know, he built his own masjid. He had marks on his forehead when he was praying. If he was invited in Shema'il Tir uh, Shema uh, Tirmidhi, uh, it, 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 it narrates that if he was invited to eat rancid fat, he would go to that house. Mm. You know, he would say, oh, what a wonderful curry vinegar is. He would dip his bread in vinegar. If for months, he'd be on aswadain, the two black things, right? Water, because it was dirty, right? And, and, and dates. You know, he would make dua about being the, you know, you know, make me of the humble. So, you know, there was one Arab or one Bedouin, he was shaking when he came to him. And I think he put his hand on his shoulder saying, you know, basically, don't worry. I, I, I come from a, an Arab woman who used to eat jerked meat, meaning I'm, you know, I'm human. So it emphasizes 
on the, the antithesis of humility. So ego, we have the sense of egoism or egocentrism as well. And again, this is a really important point because a lot of the material that is out there in terms of how to be a masculine man, whatever that means, it's all about ego. And it's about a lot of arrogance actually out there that I'm the prize or what do you bring to the table? Or I'm not paying that mahad. It's all, a lot of it is ego driven. A lot of it is trying to give yourself this fake self-importance because your lack of confidence you're trying to lift yourself up by being arrogant, basically. And that is not the way to be. Just as Hamza is mentioning here, humility is actually the way of the Prophet The Prophet acted humble, but it didn't mean that he let people walk over him. He was just humble. So our default state should be humility, being in having that self-control, having no ounce of ego, not doing things because we lack control of our ego or we lack control of our emotions, but doing things in a very deliberate way. And one of those ways is to be humble. And it's very easy actually to see how you can be humble and not get walked upon at the same time. There's no contradiction there whatsoever. It's very important that we, you know, both sides, the feminists, the liberals, those secular inclined, those, I don't know, the moderates, whatever you, I don't like these labels generally speaking, but they say, oh, look, the Prophet Sallam was compassionate and he was kind and he had haya, right? Like a virgin bride. This is all correct. But don't be reductionist. Don't reduce the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam just to these traits. Why haven't you mentioned the fact that he was so courageous? He was in the front of the battle. He was fierce in battle. He was assertive. He was brave. Why don't you mention some of these things? Why don't you mention the fact that, you know, he had... You know, uh, uh, strength, he was very strong, mm. right? Physically and also strong from the point of view in his intimate affairs, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Why are these not highlighted? And this, there is a problem here is because many people who engage with the character of the Prophet Sallam, they do so through what? A certain lens, mm. an ideological lens. Right. They may be liberals, they may be quasi-liberals, they may be secularists, they may be postmodernists, they may be, I don't know, whatever. And they use that as a lens to see the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I'm a true believer in trying to remove that baggage and allowing the prophetic character to speak for itself. Absolutely. This is what I had to do when it came to writing the book, The Shepherd's Way. I had to actually get rid of any ideas as much as I could of what I read in the past, what I already think, my life experiences. And in fact, I was going to go back to some books that were written by non-Muslims on the topic of masculinity, some really good books actually. And I was going to incorporate those into the book, the ideas that I felt were good or in line with the Quran and Sunnah. But I ended up not doing that whatsoever. And what I ended up doing is purely taking the hadith, the ayat from the Quran and their explanation and some other quotes and stories of people like, you know, Sahaba and Umar ibn Abdul Aziz and these people. And what I ended up with was actually what Hamza is talking about here. No lens, no interpretation as much as possible. And just giving the people the unfiltered, uncensored view of the Prophet ﷺ. And that's why I believe my book, it will anger feminists and it will anger red pill guys, right? Because it shows the Prophet ﷺ from all his different angles. And it shows you some of the complexities and nuances of how the Prophet ﷺ would act. He would not just act in a dominant way. He would not just act in a soft and humble way. He would act in different ways depending on different circumstances. Also, there were some principles that were just throughout, right? No matter what, he would act a certain way. And then there were some ways that he would adapt according to the situation. But you would not get that if I approached the book looking from the angle of, okay, um, I'm, I'm red pill, now let me write the book. I'm a feminist, let me write the book that way. No, I tried as much to just get rid of it. The way that I know that, inshallah, it was a sincere attempt at doing that, is because my mind was changed when writing the book. Some of the attitudes I had actually changed when writing the book. And that's why I think the book will transform your life and your view of things as well. We had people like a brother, alhamdulillah, he maybe was had the issue where he didn't have enough backbone. And he read the book and he actually was able to stand up against his in-laws. They were pushing him to get a mortgage. And he felt from the book that I should have a bigger backbone, a stronger backbone, more character, more personality, stick to my principles more. And he told his in-laws, no, I'm not getting mortgage. I'm not buying a house that way. So this is an example of how just being exposed to the pure life of the Prophet the pure character of the Prophet and characteristics of the Prophet you will change. You will change. And that's why I recommend going through the Sira, going through the Sira multiple times from different people, different angles, 
focusing on different things, it's really powerful for your character building. Once you do, you would see haya, you would see compassion, you would see forgiveness, you would see humility, but you, you would also see courage and strength and assertiveness and maybe a sense of dominance in the right way. And that's the true as well, that you're going to see different sides to the Prophet when you go through my book or when you go through just the seerah or you go through the shama'a like Hamza is talking about here. And I think that's way more balanced because a lot of what we do is reactionary. Feminism has gone way too far. And so we react by only emphasizing some parts of the Prophet's character, the red pill side, the dominant side, the strength side. But well, then we try and leave off. We don't emphasize the other side, which might be not really, but might be more in line with what people think is like the feminist side or a softer side of Prophet. So because men crying out for that validation that yes, I can be strong. I can stick to my principle. That is the sunnah. It's not just the sunnah to be soft and forgiving and this and that. Because people are crying out for that, that's what people give. But I'm a believer we need to give both sides so that people don't bounce from one extreme to another. That's what's going to end up happening. And it's already happening with the Muslim red pill kind of guys is that they're pushing people the other extreme from feminism but what's naturally going to happen? Some guys become a victim of that and they become extreme and they make big life decisions that harm them. And then others will just go there and they'll bounce back to feminism and then bounce back to this. And we bounce between extremes, which we do not need to do because we already have the middle way. Look, Andrew's a Muslim and so he has rights and we have to honor him and we have to, we have to protect his honor. The first thing to understand is the blameworthy business activities that he engaged with regards to the women folk, etc. He stopped this, I think, a year before he became Muslim. Also with his casino business that he made a lot of money from, he, I think, because of his Islamic now disposition and he's becoming a Muslim, he has been in the process of stopping it. But there's been some logistical and other issues that has taken some time. Mm. So this is a very good sign, mm. right? So not many people talk, I'm saying this defending because not people, not many people have spoken about this. But when Andrew Tay was kind of at his peak before he got shut down and before he became Muslim, I made a few videos criticizing him and I wasn't criticizing him so much. I was focusing on the Muslim men who were following him and praising him so much. And I didn't really get it. Now I get it. Now I understand that with all the negative things that he might have said and he might be encouraging people to do without directly saying it, Muslim men just were crying out for someone who spoke their mind without censoring themselves. And that has become something quite rare to see, uh, as well as someone who is successful in a lot of areas. Now, of course, he was not successful in the Akhira before he became Muslim, in the Akhira side of things. He was not successful, but he has money, he has women. You know, these things Muslim men want. It's fine to want that. It shouldn't become the be-all and end-all. It shouldn't become our life goal and purpose. But a lot of us, we need more money than we have. We want to get married or we're not happy with our wives or whatever it is. And so I get that. But I think the main thing that attracted Muslim men to Andrew Tate, which I see as a good thing, is just speaking what you see to be the truth without censoring yourself and having some principles and sticking by those principles. And that is what was mostly expressed and I would say positive in his longer videos and interviews. In the short clips and in some of the more silly videos, maybe some of the more vlogging style videos, that was honestly a lot of it that was kind of silly. That was maybe giving off the wrong message, definitely. But the point is I criticize some of the points that he brings up and that people are following him for, people are defending him for. But now I see what people are yearning for, what the Muslim men are yearning for out there. And it's not their fault that this was only to be seen in Andrew Tate. However, it's not only to be seen in Andrew Tate. It's just that these guys are not successful enough at seeking out the right role models. For example, if you don't seek out Islamic knowledge, you're not going to know any scholars. You're not going to know any teachers of the Sharia. And a lot of these guys do embody very good characteristics. They might not be successful with money-wise. They might not have Lamborghinis, Bugatti, but again, we are Muslims. That is not the thing that we value people for. I can respect people's success in anything, in sports, in business, in their job, in their marriage, in their parenting. I can respect that, but that's not the number one thing I look up to people for. So it's half, half, half of the fault of Muslim men is they're not looking far enough for good role models that are actually good. Obviously no one's perfect, but good, where it's, there's not loads of rubbish thrown in with it. They're just looking as far as their TikTok feed, for example, which is not good enough. On the flip side, where are the Muslim men who are kind of standing up to be counted? Whether it's mentoring or coaching young men, 
putting out content that kind of helps them and guides them. Otherwise, it's a vacuum and they end up following people who are not embodying the Prophet ﷺ's way. If you're embodying the Prophet ﷺ's way 50%, however you measure it, that is better than the non-Muslims who are not implementing any of it. So at some point, we have to take that responsibility and say, look, if young Muslim men are spending time on YouTube and they're asking these questions about what it means to be a man and how should a man be in relation to anger, in relation to ego, in relation to money, they're asking these questions. And if the only people that are answering these questions online where they are non-Muslims, then that's our fault. And some of us need to stand up and be counted in terms of putting material out there. That gives them some level of guidance. We not, might not be perfect. We might not be scholars, but we have to work on that. We have to put something out that we know. And a lot of the time, you do not need to be a scholar to just give people like basic sound advice. You're 23 and I'm 33, for example. I can give you some mature advice that you might not be able to get. Whereas these non-Muslim YouTubers or red pillars, these guys, some of them are 43, but they're still very immature and they're giving the wrong advice. And they're giving advice that's not from a Muslim's worldview. So some people just have to stand up and be counted and say, I'm not perfect. I'm not successful in everything. But this content is needed. This material is needed. This some level of guidance is needed. And so I'm going to do my best. And as I do my best, I'm going to try and improve. I believe that. When he's talking about role models, that's why I, I believe. Which is, you're a man. Take care of your women. Have a masculinity. Traditional family. Be assertive. Be courageous. Be dominant in certain areas that you need to be dominant in. Mm -hmm. Have a healthy competition. And I was mentioning this to um, my children. I admire the relationship he has with his brother. No mm. one talks about this. Like really, no one has actually... Look, go to an average Asian Muslim household. Yes. Maybe not now, but the uncles, there's dispute about inheritance. They're not talking to each other for the six months. This is, a, is this a common thing? I know. I'm yes. married into the Asian community. I know. People, brothers don't talk to each other. They don't have that relationship. Look at Andrew and his brother. Notwithstanding... Your hate for them, notwithstanding maybe you think they have blameworthy activities, whatever the case may be. Just look at the relationship. That's true, Wallayani. Again, you have to get rid of your emotions. You have to be able to sit and not be personality driven, but look at values, look at actions, look at principles and say, that is a good action. That is not a good action. Not just look at the person and say, I don't like that person. Or that person did one bad thing, therefore nothing they do is good. No, we have to start being a bit more, a little bit more sophisticated with the way we think. So Andrew Tate has said some bad things or done some bad things, but Hamza is right. Look at his relationship with his brother. That's a good thing. That's something that we don't see much of in media, whether it's traditional media, movies or social media. We don't see that. And that's like quite real, the way that they express that and show that on screen, their relationship. So yeah, that is a good thing. It's okay to say that. Even if you hate somebody, it's fine and it's good and it's praiseworthy to say it. Yeah, but that thing is good. That one thing, that one action or that, that relationship, that dynamic is good. But then also brotherhood. Brotherhood is something that we don't emphasize too much. I feel like it's only really some of the most practicing, knowledgeable Muslim men who really have that brotherhood. And a lot of people lack it. A lot of people don't find people on their wavelength. And that's a problem. But we don't emphasize that enough. And so th this is a really good point that Hamza is bringing up. No one, no one should look up to Andrew Tate as, right. a, as a complete package. Okay. You should follow the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But in saying that, we have this is a symptom of a cause. Right. Where are our scholars, preachers, teachers, academics in the discourse? Mm. This righteous brigade that all of a sudden they've become lions against Andrew Tate. Yes. Where 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 is this lying attitude when it comes to liberalism, postmodernism, the uh, you know, the feminization of, of the Muslim man, of men for the past 30 or 40 years. Yeah. Where are you against postmodern trends? These, these great evils, yeah? even creedal uh, issues. Where, where's your voice? Where's your voice? Mm. Like with all due respect, you judge a man by what he doesn't say sometimes, right? right. I mean, in general, you shouldn't judge anyone in yes. kind of ontological sense because yeah. Allah is the greatest judge. But from the apparent, you judge them from what they don't say. You've been quiet on liberalism. You've been quiet on feminism. You've actually made the exception the rule. You've been quiet on key prophetic aspects of masculinity like courage, assertiveness, being able to fight for God's sake, yes. protecting our women folk, and so on and so forth. You've been quiet on all of these things and Andrew Tate comes along, now you've become a lion. Shut your mouth. Sorry, that's what they deserve to say. Yeah. Absolutely. I don't want it to sound like we're saying there are, there's no one out there when it comes to uh, scholars or just 
preachers that don't show good character. Some of these guys, all they have is that they studied Sharia. That is not enough when it comes to role models and when it comes to what you're actually teaching, because teaching is not information only, it is transformation. It is character. It should come from that knowledge you're gaining. It should actually transform you. So a lot of people, they're just giving information, but we need to give transformation. And when you're a teacher, with that, whether you like it or not, you're a role model. So there are some out there. I don't want to say there's no one out there who is a good role model, but definitely most in the English speaking world are not good role models. Most of them are like overweight, for example. Most of them do not have their finances in check. Most of them are not following the Sharia sometimes as strictly as they should as a role model. And a lot of them are being bulldozed by the feminist narrative and this new worldview that is being pushed on this agenda. And that is the opposite of what a Muslim man should be like in terms of having your principles and not budging. Some principles can be compromised slightly, some situations. But when it comes to fundamental principles and being a principled man, this is one of the number one things that us as Muslim men, we should be striving for. We should be striving to be a man of principles who doesn't change his views, his actions, his principles based on being criticized, based on pressure. We should hold our ground. It's in the ayah about Muslim men. They didn't change. They didn't change their principles. So we have a role model problem. Part of it is the good brothers who are good role models are not standing up. And part of it is that a lot of the people that we look up to, like scholars and stuff, they're not really about that life, unfortunately. To focus on what's in your heart. There's something wrong with you. What's happened to you? Yeah. Look, I don't want my son to emulate Andrew Tate, but do I want my son to em emulate his eloquence? Yes. Do I want my son to emulate his articulation? Yes. Do I want my son to emulate that he would be a good, good kickboxer? Absolutely. Do I want my son to emulate that he is assertive and dominant in the business sphere, that he's able to take care of his wife or wives? Absolutely. Mm. So these things are, are praiseworthy. Look, we can't counsel these people. We can de help develop them and give people the tools to understand what is good and what is bad. But mm. I am a strong believer of enrolling, not controlling. Yeah. Enroll people in your behavior. The person wanted the Sahaba to shave their heads. Mm. They didn't shave their heads. And we know the context and the story. Mm. He went to his wife, right? Um Salama. Yes. May Allah, may Allah uh, be pleased with her. Amen. She said, shave your head. He shaved his head. What happened? They all shaved We them. need role models. Now, some yeah. people argue, no. You know, people should seek role models, but we don't live in that world. We need to become role models. And that doesn't mean all our scholars now have to reduce their bellies and become like Andrew Tate mm. and have to be fit and fighters. No, but don't, don't now complain and don't uh, create barriers for that to, to, to take place. Exactly. And before you do these things, before you tidy yourself up or you lose weight or you learn to be a better speaker, before you do these things to be a better role model, you do it for yourself because these things are part of our being a good Muslim, to be strong, to be healthy, to have stronger da'wah, be better at speaking. These things should be done firstly for yourself, for your akhirah. And then as a role model, you're going to be a better role model. And Hamza said, not everyone has to be like this. Of course, some people, they're going to be like just so in the books. And I, I'm a big believer in focus and specialization. But what we should not have is where an important part of our life is completely neglected. So let's say me, my big focus is business. But it doesn't mean I can be unhealthy. I still need a certain minimum level of health. It doesn't mean I can neglect my ibadah. No, I still need certain levels of ibadah. Like I might not be a scholar and be going to those levels in terms of seeking knowledge, but it doesn't mean I can't be fasting. I can't be reading Quran. I can't be doing some level of study. These things will make me balanced. Like they say, T-shaped person, where you're deep into a specialization. That's the T-shape. You're deep in something, but then you have this broad, like a wide interest, you're balanced. You have a specialization, but you have a balanced view as well of things and abilities. So this is actually what we need more balance where yes, you're specialized in knowledge, let's say, and you're teaching the Sharia, but then come on, you can't fully neglect your health. You can't fully neglect your wife or your kids. You can't fully neglect your money. So we have to be people of more balance, a bit more balance. No choice but to select the right people that are articulate, they're Islamic, the orthodox, they're connected to the Quran and the Sunnah. Yeah. This is what we need. Do you see my point? I, maybe it was a bit fuzzy, these thoughts, but the point is we need to become the role models, right? Yes. So even me, you know, I may have a kind of social media profile. So I need to be conscious now of the way I look. Yes. For the sake of Allah, I need to be conscious of, of the way I express myself. That was a very important point you just said. I need to be conscious of the way I look for the sake of Allah. 
And so, of course, intentions come into this, but it is very possible to start, for example, you're somebody who maybe you're successful in something. You have some basic Islamic knowledge. You try to live your best, best according to Allah and the Prophet And you have people that you can ask for advice on when it comes to this. You go and start a YouTube channel if you have the ability and the time and stuff. Just again to be a role model. Or being a role model, sometimes it's way simpler than being an influencer or being a speaker or giving the khutbah or teaching sharia. No, you're a role model for your younger brother. You're a role model for your friends. For your friends, people of the same age as you. You can be a role model for them. Even people older than you, you can be a role model. I know people ask me for advice and stuff when it comes to business who are older than me, 10 years older than me even, then that's fully possible. So it's not about being a, a public figure, a role model publicly to thousands of people. Sometimes it's just about within your family or your friend group or people that you see now and then. You can be a role model on that side of things. And you know why I mentioned earlier about the assumption, the ethical assumption of the LGBTQ narrative that they have self-ownership. So how does that go against the Islamic Aqidah? Well, Allah's will be the fact that he owns everything. That's a very basic example, but that's a, an example of applied Aqidah. Mm. So we need to teach our young men applied Aqidah in Allah's names and attributes. Okay. And what I mean by Allah's names and attributes, basically to not only to enumerate them and memorize them, but to internalize them based on the hadith, yeah. which is, for example, if, if Allah is Ar-Rahman, He is intensely merciful, then you should be as merciful as possible from a human perspective. If Allah is Al-Mutakabbir, He is like in the majestic and the, and the proud, yeah. then you should be totally humble. So you actualize His names and attributes in your life. And you make it real. So you make the Quran and Sunnah and the, 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 the creedal statements from the Quran and Sunnah real and applied in your life from an intellectual and spiritual level. That's a missing discourse at the moment. Really? And you learn Aqidah Tahawiyah. Go to most of the, the kind of, I don't know, the institutes. And you learn it in a nice classical way, but you won't adopt the methodology of the classical scholars, which is applying it in your time. Yes. And that is one of the crises of our knowledge at the moment. You know, subhanAllah, when I'm coaching Muslim men, this often comes up that if you have knowledge of Allah and His Prophet that will help you in so many things. It will help you in getting Allah's help when it comes to your business or your marriage or these pursuits you have. It will help you get Allah's help because you know about Allah, you can worship Allah better, you know how to ask from Allah better, all of these things. But also just in your life, like living your life with purpose, knowing that Allah's got your back because Allah has these names and attributes. This is something that will build character. It will give you immense confidence to go through life knowing that your Lord who created you and who takes care of you and who is the best one to be relied on, he has these attributes. And if you don't know that, you're going to lack confidence no matter what. And also to have fear of Allah. That actually gives you confidence, believe it or not. That gives you confidence that Allah is above all things and you have to be humble. But also people who get in your way, people who cause issues for you, they need to understand that Allah is above them as well. And so all these things come together to give you confidence. And it's like real life personal development, to be honest to learn about Allah's name and attributes. Number two, purification of the heart. Okay. This is without a doubt one of the most important things. Remember what I said earlier, you can't yes. plant a seed on a rock. And the heart, the, the qalb, the taqallub, it wavers, okay? And it has fitan. The fitan are shahawat and shubuhat, blameworthy desires and destructive doubts. And the heart, have, the heart has diseases. And there are main diseases, we mentioned them before, kibr, hasad, riyah, and ujub, mm. ostentation, self-amazement, vanity, blameworthy jealousy, and arrogance. There are tools in the Quran and Sunnah to deal with these. We need to give our youth these tools and, and give them the ability to recognize these diseases in their hearts and that they're able to traverse a path to, to deal with these diseases in accordance to the Quran and the Sunnah. This mm. is critical because this would affect everything in their life because in Islam, You, everything that you do is really a derivative of your heart state, not just your mind state, your heart state, yeah? Whether it's your ibadah, whether it's the way you treat others, whether it's how you forgive, whether it's you react egocentrically and egotistically to videos. Mm. That's all because of what's going on here. It's one of the most important things. And this is based on the kitab and the sunnah. Okay, so now I said learning the practical aqidah. Okay, good. We talked about that. Now he's talking about purification of the heart. Uh, of course, we can't disagree with that whatsoever. That is something that's going to build your character. And as a Muslim man, you want a strong character. What does it mean? It means that you know who you are. You know how you act. You know your principles. You don't waver from those principles. This is what a good character is. Also, your mannerisms, how you deal with other people is part of your character. And a lot of that comes from inside. What's inside? The heart. So you have to clean your heart. What is good? You can study purification of the heart in and of itself. 
Or you can simply learn the names of attributes of Allah. You can go through the seerah. You can go through the attributes of the Prophet ﷺ. You can go through tafsir of the Quran. All these things build upon this, I think. But also you can study this in and of itself. The other thing I would say is, is ibadah, which is the fourth point, I believe. So what do I mean by ibadah? I don't mean the fara'id, five daily prayers, yeah. fasting Ramadan. I'm talking about, especially in the West, a Muslim man and even a woman, right? But a, from the perspective of a Muslim man, he needs to have a routine, a routine, especially spiritual routine. So you have to, without a doubt, engage in the dhikr, the afkar of the morning of the, in the evening mm. and the du'as in the morning and the evening without fail. And then he's saying afkar. And you know, you might be thinking, oh, these are all just like religious things. Yet he, religious things, if you want to call it that, they... Firstly, this is the purpose of our life, to worship Allah. Secondly, Allah gave us guidance on how to live our life that would be best for us in the dunya and the akhirah. So if you want success in something, if you want respect from those around you, if you want uh, to do better in your job or to start a business or to get married or to whatever it is, you need help from Allah. And you get help from Allah by following Allah's way, following Allah's guidance. So a lot of people, they're like seeking Islamic knowledge or doing all these extra ibadat. How is that going to help me with trying to be a good man, a strong man, physically strong, get my money up, get married. How's it going to help me with that? Well, I will. Well, I will. And that's maybe what we need to do is to convince our friends, Muslim men, that this is actually the way. This is a big part of the way. And that's why in the front row, we actually have a night prayer that we do. And we hold each other accountable to pray the night prayer because it's going to strengthen us in all these pursuits, not just in the akhirah, but which is the main thing, but not just in that in our worldly pursuits as well. It elevates you, it purifies you. And also what they need to do is do istighfar every day, at least 100 times every day. Yeah, This is without fail, that's one aspect. Right. The other aspect is that they should do tadabbur of the Quran. Allah says, do they, do they not ponder over the Quran or the locks on their hearts? You can mirror the meaning. So the more tadabbur you do, the more your heart becomes unlocked to receive his and guidance. Tadabbur meaning? Tadabbur means pondering over the Quran. Right. Because sometimes we focus on recitation, which is very good. It's a shifa. It's it's a form of glorifying Allah for sure. Mm. But I would emphasize tadabbur over recitation. Sure. Yeah, because Allah wants you to be guided. He wants you to understand His message. Yes. Engage with the meaning. So tadabbur technically is different from tafsir, but they've been used synonymously in some places in the tradition. But technically speaking, tafsir in a basic sense is meaning. Tadabbur is implication of meaning. So understand the meaning from scholars, students of knowledge, the tafsir, the exegetical works, mm. and then now apply it in your life. Know that this word is from Allah and Allah wants something from you. Allah is talking to you directly. Now he's gone a bit off topic because he was supposed to be talking about what would you teach Muslim men in a curriculum if there was a school or something. And now he's talking about things they should do. I guess the school could make it a homework or something to pray the night prayer or do your adhkar and stuff. But these are generally good practices and habits to get into. What I wanted to add is that we do need an element of psychology, I think, self-awareness, understanding yourself. We need to teach people how to understand themselves and how the brain works a little bit and why they might be thinking certain things. That's one thing. The second thing is the physical exercise. I think Hamza mentioned this later on, is that every Muslim man should have exercise in their life. It could actually be just walking, walking 10,000 steps a day or whatever. It could be bodybuilding. It could be a, a sport, but you need movement. You need to regulate your sleep times, your wake-up times, all of this to be a high performer. A Muslim man is a high performer. How do we become a high performer? We have all the ibadah, the knowledge of Allah. These things are powering us. But then also we need a good routine. We need good energy. We need a good, strong body to do these things. And then on top of that, there is a finance side. The finances come from Allah. And sometimes you might be doing the exact same business as someone else. And one of you gets loads of money from it and one of you doesn't. And that's something that Allah just gives it. That's his risk. However, a lot can be unlocked in this world with money. A lot of problems come from not having money or not using your money properly or not managing your money properly. And so that's another thing that we could incorporate is teaching either about how to increase your income as a, if you have a job or business, how to start a business or how to negotiate, how to communicate well. These are all like fundamental skills that if you were going through a school and you've got years and years to learn, these things would be really good to incorporate. These are things that's helped me ultimately in my business, in my life. I've taken an interest in business, in marketing, in psychology, and I've gained some Islamic knowledge over the years. So all of these things, no doubt, have helped me so, so much. And just as a passion or a hobby, I'm into managing finances. Like I'm kind of a geek. That's definitely helped me as well. And I see a lot of guys throwing money away 
at things that are just not good uses of money. And that could have really gone to something else and helped them. And of course, we're held accountable for what we spend money on. So that's a shame to see that. Final point is physical activity. Don't be a lazy bum. Do something. I'm not saying you have to be big bodybuilder. Actually, bodybuilding is vanity. Yeah, It's a waste of time. Mm. Be functional with your fitness. Yeah, You have to know how to fight. For sure. I'm not saying you have to be aggressive and hurt people. No. The, the, the Saudi principle, there is no harming, no reciprocating of harm. But if you have to protect your women folk, you have to protect yourself, then you have to do that. And plus, it also shapes your disposition. Uh, the way you walk, you just have a sense of confidence about you. Right? You could tell who's a fighter. I usually can tell, I think. You know, this guy, he knows how to fight. He's strong. He, he You know, I'm not going to mess with this guy. Yeah, It's the, it's the way you walk. And I think there was a study done by, um, by I think, criminologists or something, or psychologists. Mm. And they asked uh, criminals, who would, who would you attack on the street or something? And it wasn't to do with size or whatever. It was to do with the fact of how they walked. Yeah, they had a, a they had a, I forgot what the term was used. It was they had an organized walk or something. Yeah, because the way you come across. Yeah, so it's very important. You know, the person recommended things like archery and swimming, horse riding, and you know, you have wrestling, martial arts, kickboxing, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. You need to be active as a male. Yeah, now it doesn't mean you have to be big, and but you have to be able to be an optimized version of yourself. Yeah, exactly. You don't have to be big. This is the thing. You don't have to be what people would consider, oh, that guy's buff, that guy's big, that guy's this and that. But you just for yourself, you have to be strong. You have to be healthy. Basically healthy seems to be this high bar now, but no, just be healthy. Don't be overweight. Have some decent stamina. And he's saying bodybuilding is uh, often vanity, which should make sense. Circuit training is good. Circuit training often is with weights. It's something you can do in a gym but it's more functional. Okay, so this was the video from Hamza on the Thinking Muslim podcast. And I think what he said was amazing. I shared a lot of that with you. I took out the key points for you that covers this topic of masculinity. And at the end, he even went through specifically what he recommends you to do. I would actually agree with all of that stuff. I think maybe the order of it could be changed a bit. The details of how to actually implement that in your life as habits and how to get stuff done. Like sometimes productivity is our biggest issue as well as our mindset these are the two biggest issues and so all those list of things he gave a lot of people struggle to implement that so that's why we need a method for doing those two things changing our mindset which is a big barrier probably the biggest barrier mindset and then how do i be a performer how do i be a high performer where i get stuff done that's a big thing that's what we're going to cover in future videos inshallah so thanks for watching and watch this video next it's going to be great